Real Estate 101 with Boyle Team Real Estate. Hello, everybody. It's Marlene Boyle from Boyle Team Real Estate, and we are here today with our Buyer Series Podcast, Episode 2. Today, we are here with Laura Beam, and Laura is a mortgage agent with Mortgage Architects. Welcome, Laura. Hi, Marlene. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And today, we're going to be talking about um, getting mortgages and approvals when you are self-employed. So Laura, can you tell us a little bit about yourself first? You know, you're, you live in Clarington. What did you do before you were a mortgage specialist? Yeah, so I have been a resident of Durham region basically my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, moved to Bowmanville 18 years ago uh, this year, so okay. it's been quite a long time. I live up in Tyrone uh, with my family. Yeah. Um, previous to becoming a mortgage agent, I actually worked at Loblaw's head office and a bunch of uh, kind of well-known realtors and decided to make the leap into self-employed uh, business about yeah. three years ago as a mortgage agent. So you went through the whole self-employed mortgage yourself. So I you, did. you have some experience there with that. And so you're with Mortgage Architects. So do they deal with commercial, residential? Uh, so we do deal with commercial and residential construction. Kind of everything is covered. I specialize in residential mortgages, but okay. have contacts on my team who deal with commercial. Okay, great. And do you guys, I'm assuming you deal with B lenders as well, A lenders, B lenders? Yeah, so we have A lenders, alternative lenders, and privates as well. Okay, perfect. So you were in the corporate world, and what made you transfer kind of over to mortgages? Yeah, so uh, to be honest, I actually loved my job. I loved um, I loved working kind of in the corporate world. I used to travel quite a bit to the U.S. I actually traveled about three times a month down to the U.S. to different parts of the nice. States. Um, and to be honest, I just kind of sat back and reflected and really wanted to be, as I put it, in control of my own destiny. Yeah. So I nice. uh, kind of wanted control of my own destiny, so yeah. decided to make the leap into uh, working for myself. I've always had a passion for real estate. Uh, my husband and I have owned a couple rentals uh, and I have a really strong personal finance background. So it was a great compliment for kind of what I was looking Perfect. for. Perfect. Yes. And it shows because Laura is absolutely wonderful at what she does. Um, so today we're going to be talking about self-employed mortgages. Um, so it's kind of to dive right into it, it's definitely more difficult for people, as everybody knows, when you're self-employed to get a mortgage approval. Um, and typically they take two years of income to, for that approval. Is there any way around that? Um, is there anything to, that they have offer that they can get around the two year approval? Yeah, so we actually do have lenders now that will look at less than two years history. Uh, two years is always great, but mm -hmm. if you are new to self-employed, uh, there are options for you to get approved with less than two years history. Uh, always a great benefit if you're transitioning from like say you worked uh, at a company as an IT consultant and then you opened up your own IT uh, firm but yet we do have options for people that have been in business for less than two years. Okay so, and then the thing we were trying to touch on today is when you're doing your taxes right now Laura was mentioning that these taxes this year in 2023 are going to be going towards any income towards your 2025 purchase up to 2025. Yeah. That be... Yeah. So we're recommending that if you have a mortgage coming up for renewal, uh, you're thinking of buying another property or buying just your first property and you are self-employed, uh, the taxes that you're in the middle of getting ready to file right now will be used for those financing decisions all the way until 2025. Right. Um, so we actually recommend that you align with your accountant on those plans so that you are kind of claiming the appropriate amount of income uh, so that you don't kind of um, interfere with a decision of purchase a couple years down down the road. Right, because they will be, 2023 will be that. Yeah. Right? All righty. Can you elaborate, Laura, on the challenges that self-employed people have when trying to get a mortgage? Yeah, so the, the biggest problem that self-employed people have is you actually write down a lot of your income with your expenses. So uh, take my husband as an example, he's a landscaper. So while he pulls in a certain amount of sales from his landscaping business, he also gets to write off things like his truck, his cell phone, right. that normally uh, if you weren't self-employed, you would have to pay those kind of out of pocket with your after-tax dollars. So what ends up happening is the income you're claiming to the government can be quite low or just lower than what you're actually kind of making when you take out some of those expenses. Um, so that's why we like to align with accounts where possible on how much write-offs you do want to be taking. 
Um, but there are options actually to grow some of that income back up when you are uh, applying for a mortgage. Uh, so certain lenders will allow us to take the money that you claimed on your taxes and actually bump it back up because they oh, know okay. you're actually yes. writing off um, expenses that the normal uh, kind of average Joe right. wouldn't be able to write off. Right. And then do they take, do, so all lenders, would they take only personal income or would they um, accept any type of business income on top of that? Or then does it actually go to commercial at that point? Uh, so there's two ways that they would look at uh, a self-employed person. So the first person is someone that's not incorporated. So whether you're in partnership with someone else or you're self-employed, right. but you're not incorporated. Uh, in that example, what they would do, just really rough math, is they take the amount that you claimed on your taxes, your yep. personal amount, and you gross it up by 15 or 20%, depending on the lender. Um, if you're incorporated, a lot of people that are incorporated, one of the benefits to being incorporated is you can actually leave a lot of right. your money in the corporation. Yes. And there are lenders that will actually let us look at the income that's in your corporation. Oh, they can. That's good. Yes. Okay. Uh, and that's a big um, point that's not well known, uh, that there are lenders that will look at that. And the key thing is not every lender or bank looks at every situation the exact same way. So you can get a different approval amount if you went to Scotia versus TD versus First National. Right. Because they all look at the income differently according to to their guidelines. So the, yeah, okay. there are a couple lenders that will allow us to use that money that's sitting in the corporation. Okay. Now, does it matter if it's a holding company? Does that come in like a hold co as a, as a you know what I mean? Yeah. So when you are incorporated, uh, you run your business under your operating company. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then uh, from a, li a liability standpoint, yes. accountants like us to create holding companies yep. so that you transfer the money over there. So that if you get sued, someone can't come after that Correct. money. Um, so more and more people, when you are buying real estate, you want to buy it in your holding company because then if you did get sued from your business, they couldn't come after it. Uh, so yes, we can uh, purchase, do purchases in someone's holding company. Uh, the one challenge is not every lender will do it. So you're just kind of restricting your available options if you purchase in a holding company. But there are lenders that will for sure let us do purchases in a holding company. Is it then considered a commercial mortgage where the interest rate is then higher? So not ne not necessarily. So okay. if it's in a holding company, usually the self-employed person would have to personally guarantee that. And right. in that case, it's still on the residential side. Okay. So the lower interest rate. Yep. Normal traditional rates. There's like a tiny increase uh, because it's in a holding company. It's like 0.1 or 10, okay. 10 basis points. Nothing crazy. Um, it's only when you start to get to either the zoning on the property you're trying to buy is commercial, yes. then typically it would go over to the commercial side, or you need the income from the property to kind of carry the debt on that property completely okay. on its own is when you start to look at more of a commercial mortgage. Okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. And also, um, I know I touched upon this before in another um, episode I did, but when somebody's looking to purchase and they have are self-employed, they have to put a longer finance clause in just so everybody knows, because it does take longer, you know, for the approval for that. Yeah. So for commercial, a hundred percent, you need like quite a long, uh, kind usually, of, usually we do like a 30 days. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, and then if you're just like typically self-employed and you're trying to buy in your personal name or the holding company, but on the residential side, yeah. you can get pre-approved like you would normally beforehand. And then it's right. your traditional like three to five day condition. Right. Correct. That's good. Yeah. Um, are there any programs out there, Laura? Because I know with the with the stress test right now, there's a limitation on what people can borrow. Are there any, lim are there any programs or incentives that offer self-employed people maybe to not have to do the stress test? Yep. So there are actually, there's a, a few of them. So there, the first one is there are lenders that as long as you have 20% down there, you can not uh, go against the stress. Really? Test. Okay. Yeah. So you literally would qualify at whatever interest rate you're being offered. Um, the other option is while you're still kind of qualifying them at the stress test, they let them go way over the kind of ratios we look at from right. a debt perspective, as long as you have some equity in the house. So they, the lender really understands, okay, this is a small business owner. They're right. writing off a lot of expenses, but they have a lot of income uh, or equity in the house, which 
we're going to let them go significantly above the stress test in that example. Do they take any um, equity in um, like equipment or whatnot, like any outside things that the business owns, any assets? So assets. Do they consider that? Investments, yes, not really assets. So as okay. an example, if you owned a really expensive dump truck, they right. wouldn't take that into account. But if you did have savings that yes. are liquid, so even okay. RSPs, tax-free mm-hmm. savings, money in the bank account, uh, you can actually use that to qualify for uh, property as well. So I had a client last year that had a significant amount of investments. They were mm-hmm. older on a very, very modest pension. And we were able to get them approved for almost a million dollar line of credit oh, okay. because of their investments and that the they had in the And the investment bank. is with the company though, I mean, not a personal investment. Uh, so if it's in a, if it's the in corp. a bank account yeah. owned by the corporation yeah. and you are, you own that corporation, yes, that those okay. assets can be included. Okay. If you have a partner, then we can only take 50% of okay, that. Okay. That but makes yeah. sense. So it has to be liquid assets though, not um, actual Okay, that makes like sense. That. Yeah. So talking about what they can use, so they can use assets. And what type of bank statements are they looking for? Like, is there anything in particular that you're asking, you know, the people? Yeah, for? that's a great uh, question. So uh, sometimes if you're qualifying, like with the income that you're actually using and we're grossing it up, uh, lenders will want to see bank statements just to show that the company's still like working and thriving right. just because of the delay in kind of when you file your taxes. Um, But we also have examples where, let's say you're not able to qualify using the income you're claiming at all, even when we do that gross up. There are lenders that will literally allow us to look at bank statements. So we look at six to 12 months bank statement, depending on either the lender or the client. Right. Um, And then we literally add up all of the deposits made into the account. We take out a reasonable amount of expenses for that industry. Mm -hmm. um, And then we literally use the rest of the money uh, as income on the deal. So I've done a couple hairdressers where um, they tend to do a lot of cash businesses and uh, things like that. And um, so we couldn't use their taxes. Instead, right. we use their bank statements to qualify. Okay, that, that makes sense. And then what about any um, outstanding invoices? Do they consider that? Because I know a lot of people are, especially during COVID, we're paying late. Mm-hmm. So would they take those outstanding invoices as part of the income? So I have a situation right now where uh, the person has a lot of money owing on their books. Mm-hmm. Uh, the lender was taking that into account just from an approval standpoint, but yes. not as income onto the deal. Okay. Because there is a chance that they person may not, may not pay exactly. the bill, but they, they took it into consideration, especially because their bank statements were a bit lower, but they wouldn't necessarily approve the deal based on that. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So there are some things out there to make it a lot easier because yeah. it's so challenging, right? For them now. Yeah. The other thing I'm finding and this, I would say actually is going across the board because of kind of people are having a hard time qualifying. And this actually happened to my husband and I, when we first bought our house is my husband self-employed and we actually couldn't qualify for the house that we bought in Tyrone. Right. Uh, and my father-in-law actually had to come on the mortgage as what's called the guarantor yes um so we are seeing that now either parents are co-signing or uh or uh, becoming a guarantor depending on the situation uh so that's another way that that you don't even have to be self-employed to have that help you but that's what that's what i'm seeing a lot of right now is those two situations as parents helping out by coming on the mortgage and i agree with that too i'm seeing a lot of that in the real estate side like when i'm doing the offers we're adding parents Mm -hmm. we're adding siblings you know, just to, for that extra, you know, income added. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because it's, houses are just a lot more money now and it's just not as affordable. Yeah. Right. Especially so they don't, the, they don't yeah. qualify. Mm-hmm. So the question I have is there's a lot of people who have just started their own business or maybe have only been in business a year mm-hmm. if, and they want the two year to qualify. What do they use? What do they ask for? Or do they even qualify? Do they have to wait? Well, my first tip for you, if you're thinking about becoming self-employed is definitely take care of any financing needs you have right before you become self-employed. So whether that's you already own a house to put a line of credit on your house, it actually helps with um, any bills you might have while you're kind of getting your business up and running but helps you as well qualify. So take care of any financing needs if you are going to make a big change. But let's say you've already made the change and you're kind of a year in, we do have options for clients that are kind of less than two years uh, self-employed. Okay. Uh, There's a couple of programs that are available through the insurers, which allow us to use kind of one year of uh, business uh, business income. Uh, And there's other lenders that really take like a common sense approach to applications that they understand kind of the um, 
uh, growth potential for that business and right. things like that, that they'll let us use less than two year history. Now, when we talk about insured mortgages is typically 20% down, do they ever make the self-employed um, clients insure even if they have more down because of the risk? Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it totally Question? does. Okay. Yep. So, uh, I, I think I would just change the word slightly. So yes, there are programs that if you have less than a year down, they would require you to insure it. So that's actually that program. If you have less than a, a, a year in, you can, uh, there's programs we can use to qualify you, but you would have to be insured. Uh, they would never say to someone, um, if you do qualify, oh, you're self-employed, you need to buy insurance. Right. Um, that's not really the way. That's okay. not a program that's out there. Okay. Yeah. And then what about someone who is looking to just start out to mm -hmm. before? Is that's kind of what we touched upon before? Is there mm -hmm. any other tips you can give them or? Yeah, just try to get your financing in order before because that's kind of, especially if you are already working, that's like the optimal time to get everything, kind of all your ducks in a row. Um, so while there are um, tons of amazing programs out there, it is definitely easier when you have like a normal salary coming yes. in. Yes, yes. Um, and the other thing I would say is, um, if you're in a relationship with someone, the other person has kind of a full-time job or salary, um, we don't always need to use both applicants on the deal, right? right so you can right. still come on the deal and purchase, but um, I always look at like the path of least resistance when I'm doing a mor mortgage application. Um, what's the kind of easiest way yes. to qualify? Not all people need both people on an right. application. And I think right. we forget that sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with that too. Yeah. So I know a lot of um, self-employed people do buy income properties because one, there's no pension there. Um, is there any way that the banks, the lenders will look at it differently if it's an income property as opposed to their resident, their primary home? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there, and I actually do find a trend in the industry that a lot of people buy uh, income properties to your point. Uh, and we have a lot of kind of other folks that are kind of staying at home longer, but actually want to buy a rental property. So there are... Um, all lenders will, for the most part, finance rental properties, but there are that look at the situation a little more favorably than others and let us use more of that income uh, in order to help qualify. So that's definitely a case that if you're looking at buying a rental or you have one already, I would definitely encourage you to shop around with different lenders uh, because you will get a different qualification amount depending on who you're asking, just because lenders look at that rental income very, very differently. Right, and yeah. I, I see that too, dealing with my clients and that. And then as far as the, like it's, it doesn't matter because they're self-employed, they still need for first one, 5% down. So anytime unless, people, yeah, sorry. To unless interrupt. they're relative, sorry, unless yeah. somebody's moving in their relative or whatnot. Yeah. Do they still need 20% down? Yeah. So anytime you're not living in the property mm -hmm. or a family member is not living right. there, that's a key uh, point that you pointed out. Uh, you do need to have 20% down. Um, so yeah, un unless a family member or yourself is living there, you need to have 20% down. Um, so, sorry, so it's not more if they're self-employed then they don't require no, more. Okay. No, no. Okay. You could because of like the location or um, uh, maybe that person's higher risk, but right. not just because they're okay. self-employed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And the other point, I, the other thing I'm finding in the industry now, because people are having a hard time qualifying and also want the benefit of like an income property is people are looking for houses that maybe you can rent out the basement yes. or um, have like an income suite included. And that can really increase your purchasing power. So I had right. an example the other day where a client actually qualified for $120,000 more in a purchase right. price because it had a basement apartment. Right. And they're taking, I know they take 50%, some lenders take 80 percent some take a hundred yeah yes. and now but with self we're talking self-employment is yep. there anything in particular that they did they limit it for self-employment nope. it doesn't matter no it doesn't okay. matter yeah the only i would say the only um big difference for a self-employed person is how we look at the income and just understanding again that they're writing off so much income that the banks need a way and do typically understand that there's ways to kind of add income back right. because we know they're claiming expenses that like the normal person wouldn't be able right. to claim but you're not really penalized because you're uh, right. self-employed they're not in a certain category no. type of thing and no. talking about the rentals i actually had a question for you so i know the rentals in order to use as income have to be legal however i did hear and you can just or uh, not just uh, answer this properly can you use the income from a non-legal as long as there's two separate entrances 
So there are lenders that don't require the uh, units to actually be like legal right. uh, uh, apartments. So there are some that don't need them to be legal at all. Um, it really depends on the lenders. I even have lenders that will look at um, contributory income, which is like if you have your child or your parent or whoever oh, living okay. with you. Yes. There's even lenders that will look at that income. I'm doing one right now where three kids live with the mom and all three kids pay wow, rent. And that we're sounds able to bring familiar. That up. <laughs> I've been minor pay income where there's, there's no, something no, going on here. Write that down. <laughs> yeah, note to sell. So would they take, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yep. So and that I, can really make a big difference. There's one lender that will let us use $1,200 a month in contributory income, wow. which is a lot of money, right? When you're talking yeah. about having trouble qualifying. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, that's interesting. That's good to know. But yeah, the, the one with the not, not legal apartments, I was very surprised to hear that. Mm -hmm. So that's good news too. Yep. Right. Yeah. It does depend on the lender. So it's not across yes, the board. Exactly. It's, it's really why I recommend, um, if you're not just getting approved off the hop for the amount that you want, I really recommend you do talk to other people because we can literally get one hundred, two hundred thousand dollar $200,000, um, approval right. differences because yes. of the way um, the different programs out, out yes. there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And don't do online. We do online approvals. No. Every time they come back, they're never like it's, you have to meet with a professional yeah. Yeah. and they will talk to you about it. Yeah. So yeah, that's great. This yeah. is excellent information, Laura. Is there anything, Laura, that you want to, you know, express to the public, uh, any knowledge that you want to share with them that really stands out for self-employment and self-employed income, et cetera? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just because one lender or one bank tells you one thing doesn't mean that another lender won't look at you differently. There are tons of different programs out there that we can use. I always say my job is a little bit like putting a puzzle together and you have to put the puzzle pieces together to kind of make a certain picture and sometimes yeah. the picture isn't what you want and you have to keep going. Yeah. Um, I did a deal last week and the only place I could get it done was Scotia Bank. So I have access to 57 different lenders. The only person I could get that done wow. was with Scotia, but it's because they looked at that yeah. puzzle the way I needed them to look. So if you're kind of discouraged by you're kind of not getting the answer you want is definitely talk to another lender, talk to someone that has access to more than one lender and you can definitely get a different picture. And don't give up, just keep going, talk yep. to your professionals. Yeah. Yep. So, well, thank you, Laura. I appreciate this was wonderful information and I'm sure everybody's going to learn a lot from it. Um, I always ask the question at the end of the podcast, do you have anything for the young you that you would recommend like a book, any information that you would suggest the young you to learn, to learn more, more knowledge, you know, about not even just self-employment, just in mortgages in general, lending, money. Yeah. Um, and this actually does come back from like the young me. So yep. this isn't me kind of, uh, this is definitely a book I would recommend. I really recommend the book, uh, The Automatic Millionaire. I think it teaches you a ton of different habits and tricks that really can set you on the, on the, right path to kind of saving money. And another one I like is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I think that really fits in. I think someone that's either on the entrepreneurial mindset or is self-employed yeah. would love that one as well. So those would be my two that I would recommend. That's great. We had that recommendation before. So oh, we yeah, did. Yeah, oh, so yes. it must be there yeah, go. a good, good book. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, thank you so much, Laura. I appreciate you, you know, spending the time and sharing your knowledge with us. And if you want to get a hold of Laura, we'll have her information up on the screen and you can call her anytime. So I hope everybody me. has a great day.